I am here with Kayla Padilla, currently with the USC Trojans basketball team. Kayla, growing up, who or what pushed you to play basketball? Yeah, I think it was um, multiple factors that kind of went into my want to play basketball. I think first and foremost, just being and growing up in LA, the kind of height of you know the Kobe and Shaq supremacy, it's hard not to watch that and, and not want to do it yourself. Um, but also just like my Filipino background, um, basketball is a huge part of Filipino culture, be it not a lot of people end up playing at the collegiate level or professionally, but it's something that, you know, the country just has so much support of. Um, so I think those two in particular um, kind of eventually led me to playing basketball and again, kind of just took off from there. Who are some players that you've emulated your game after? It was interesting because I was thinking about this question and I think there are a lot of players I looked up to, but not necessarily emulated. Um, I didn't watch a lot of women's basketball just because I don't think it was as popular as it was, um, especially right now. So it was hard to kind of see myself in the men's game, but obviously looked up to people like Kobe Bryant, Kevin Durant and all those people. Um, but I think what's unique about my game is that it's kind of just something of my own, um, really reliant on the fundamentals and just developing a craft of my own. I, I think one of the pillars of my game, it's it's not flashy. It's, you know, nothing extra. It's just pretty solid down to the basics, um, but it gets the job done. So I think that's something that's really been honed in ever since I started playing. And obviously with the help of the coaches, I've been able to work with them, the trainers as well. Now, was Bishop Montgomery always your choice for high school? It was always definitely at, at the top of mind. Um, I have a long history with Bishop. My mom went there. A lot of family members went there. And it's always just, you know, been a place that I've known has been so, you know, historically successful, especially, you know, within the basketball realm. Um, but again, basketball and academics, as it was college, was guiding my high school decision. So you know, I was looking at schools like Modern Day, who have always had such a powerhouse in basketball as well. Um, but also exploring things where um, maybe academics took more of a forefront. But I think Bishop offered you know, the best combination of both. And then again, it was a place where, where my family knew um, and, and very close to home. So at the end of the day, I think it was the perfect decision to go there. What year did your mom, you said your mom went there? Yeah, I think it was 95, 94, 95, I'm pretty sure. Okay, a couple years, couple years before me. Yeah. Now, while you were at Bishop, you got to play for current WNBA coach and uh, Bishop Montgomery legend in Noelle Quinn. What are some things that you learned from her that you still utilize? There are a ton of things I learned from Coach Quinn. Um, just like as a fun anecdote, I remember her coming in. It was my sophomore year. Um, and, you know, since freshman year, her her name and her jersey would just stare at me during practices. And, and it was cool to finally have her in the flesh be on our court. Um, so ever since the first day she became our coach, we played one on one after every single practice. So I was a sophomore playing against at that time, a current WNBA player. Um, so I think she just kind of first and foremost drilled in the importance of working hard, putting in extra work. Um, but I think what's so great about her is she's super humble. And I like to take after that in terms of her humility as great as she is and you know the list of all of her accomplishments you'd never think she was a superstar because she never acts like one um so that's what i love about her but i think one of the most big picture things that i learned from her that i still continue to implement in my game and in my life to this day is that she just talked about the importance of you know that you know there's bigger things in life than basketball as much as we want to devote our all into the sport that we love and and train for on a daily basis um, you know, there are bigger things to do. There's, it's not just being a good basketball player, it's being good students, being a good, you know, daughter, being a good sister, it's being a good human being. Um, so I think she made sure that we were aware of that, you know, as young as we were just in high school, just to, you know, put things into perspective. She is definitely one of my favorite human beings. Same here. How would you describe your time at Bishop? Man, my time at Bishop was awesome. Uh, I mean, I basically went in accomplishing almost or getting out almost everything I wanted to. Um, what, I, what I set out to do at the forefront, you know, came out with a few league titles, uh, CIF championship my sophomore year. Um, so definitely on like an accolade sort of level, 
checked all the boxes. But again, I think I've just been super blessed, you know, as much as I put in the work, both academically and athletically, I think just as much as that, it's, I've also been surrounded by so many great people. And, you know, Coach Quinn is just one of the great people I've been able to become really close with that I got from Bishop. But just, you know, the amount of teachers I became close with and the amount of resources and friends that I still have to this day from Bishop, um, it's long lasting. And I think that sense of community that they always pride themselves on, it really holds true. Um, so I'd say my time at Bishop was just, in one word, just special um, and couldn't have asked for a better experience. Now, while you were there, you were one of the best players in the area. What college offers came your way? And what made you decide on heading toward the Ivy Leagues and Penn? Sure. So I, in addition to obviously playing at Bishop, I played on a club team in the Nike circuit. And I think a lot of the attention um, that I got was generated from playing, you know, in tournaments, you know, across the country and just on those high level circuits. Um, so I would say a majority of my offers came from a lot of mid-majors, um, a lot from the West Coast Conference, so close to home. Um, but in addition to the West Coast Conference, it was either, you know, 20 minutes away or 2,000 miles away. So it was either the West Coast Conference or the Ivy League for me. Um, and I, you know, truthfully growing up and even my freshman year, never knew that the Ivy League could be an option for me to play, um, especially, you know, at the collegiate level and, you know, getting a scholarship to play basketball. Um, but, you know, learning more about it, I just realized how great of an opportunity it was to, you know, not only play you know, in a, in a very competitive conference, one that I think is completely on the rise, but also to, to get an Ivy League degree. I mean, it's unparalleled. Um, so I think, you know, balancing those choices as much as I love being home and uh, very close to my family, I think Penn specifically offered, again, kind of the best of both worlds and being able to, you know, gain my independence in a new city, um, studying business, being able to attend the best undergraduate business school in the world, and then three, be able to make an immediate impact on the court um, and get some valuable minutes as a freshman. Um, so obviously this is something I know in, in retrospect, but like I think coming in, those were sort of the three things that especially drew me to, to Penn especially. Now coming into college, what were some of the goals that you had set for yourself and how did you achieve them while you were at Penn? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as a freshman, it's a bit tough to kind of set these big goals for yourself. I've never been one to kind of pressure myself with, you know, like win an NCAA championship or, um, you know, win rookie of the year. I actually found a piece of paper I wrote before my first fresh game of my freshman year. It was like, give great high fives, maybe score like five points, like get in for double digit minutes. Um, so I obviously like wanted to be realistic about sort of, you know, what my playing time could be, what my impact could be. Um, and I think that kind of draws from, you know, my sort of, you know, the humility that I like to carry myself with. Um, but I think, you know, once I started to realize how much of an impact I can actually make at that level, which is, again, a really a credit to the high level of competition I played at Bishop and again on the club circuit, uh, I realized that I could actually set those big goals for myself. So I knew at the end of freshman year, I wanted to, to be rookie of the year and to get an Ivy League championship. Um, and, you know, although I fell short of the Ivy League championship part, I think the most important thing for me was, you know, not necessarily getting a certain accolade, but like leaving my mark um, on the team and in the program, you know, just as a good teammate, you know, someone that the younger kids could look up to and, and someone that who not only made an impact on the court, but off the court as well. Um, and obviously there's no way to measure that, but I think I did a pretty good job, you know, at the end of the day, being able to accomplish sort of the intangible goals I had for myself. Aside from averaging over 15 points a game for four <laughs> years, of course, very <laughs> humble young woman you are. Uh, now, before Thanksgiving, you played against USC at Galen Center, right. and this was a very Caleb Padilla friendly crowd. I brought my kids out. We had a blast. It was the first time I'd seen you play live since your high school all-star game how would you describe that experience uh, that experience was amazing um there were a lot of things that went into it uh, i was really lucky that penn was able to bring the team to california not just then but also the year prior um we played you know, a couple of teams as a part of the lmu tournament so it's always special because you know only a handful of people get to go out to Penn or go out to the East Coast to see me play. So it was nice to finally, you know, 
have an opportunity where multiple people, whether it be friends or family, to, to come out and see me play the game I love. Um, but an also interesting piece of that was I kind of already knew I was going to be taking this grad year and USC has been on my radar just by nature of growing up in Southern California and just knowing the history of you know, the success of their team and just what a great school it was. So it was one, like uh, almost uh, an audition for, for USC, but also two, just a chance to again, celebrate, you know, the career I've had with a, a lot of people that have supported me and got me there in the first place. But I mean, it was awesome. Like, I think there were a full section was just for people um, that I knew. So it was amazing to, to play in front of that crowd. And obviously now knowing that could happen on a more regular basis, um, it was awesome. So, you know, although we didn't come out with the win, I think it was a really competitive game. Um, and just glad again, people could see me in that atmosphere and, um, you know, and we'll do it again soon. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I love that. While you were at Penn, you launched a platform called the Sideline Post, which is very much very similar to the Players' Tribune, but for collegiate athletes. What was your inspiration behind that? Yeah, I think a lot of my college career, I've been, you know, trying to engage with the idea of being more than an athlete. Um, and like I kind of alluded to earlier, as great of a basketball player you can be, um, there's layers to, to you beyond that, you know, again, being a good student, being a good human being. And I think one of the ways I've, I think I've really touched on that topic was through the sideline post. Um, so I was a big fan of the players should be, and I'm sure, you know, Derek Jeter founded, um, and realized there was no sort of similar platform for college students. So I was thinking to myself, you know, like, what if one day I wanted to write a story for the players should be in? You know, probably not realistic. I mean, you know, people like Sabrina, Sabrina Ionescu could probably write for the Players Tribune, but what about me attending a mid-major college, which, you know, not necessarily on the radar of, you know, these highly populated like outlets. Um, so realizing that there was this gap and also it was kind of perfect timing with COVID and being able to go home and having, you know, this amount of free time, um, decided to launch the sideline post and I believe it was April of 2020. And so it's essentially just giving college players like myself, whether you're the MVP of the, you know, number one team in the country or a bench warmer at a junior college, like you're given the same opportunity to share your story and write about important topics through your own words, which I think is the most essential part of the platform. And it's been great. We've published almost 60 stories since we've started and um, have been able to share a lot of, you know, really great pieces from college athletes around the world. So it's one of the things I'm most proud of, you know, throughout my college career. Are you going to try to get Caleb Williams to talk about his journey from D.C. to Oklahoma to California? That would be awesome. I think that'd be a big plus for the platform. It's definitely being here is definitely going to open up a lot of new doors for people to write for the platform. So I'm excited. I love that. You now you're currently enrolled at USC. Of course, we've talked about that. But tell me about your decision to come home. And USC is on a good day, 25 minutes away from home. On a bad day, very frustrating, two hours away right. from home. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, no, so the process, again, of just the whole grad transfer situation, a lot of people are kind of not familiar with um, my decision to transfer. They they thought I, like, you know, just wanted to leave the Ivy League, but it was actually sort of a mandated rule um, that Ivy League, wouldn't allow graduate players to play and continue to play for their programs. So if I wanted to continue and use my last year of eligibility due to COVID, I had to transfer to another school. Um, so I, again, as I said um, prior to the, in, with the USC question, um, I already sort of knew going into my senior year that that would be a viable option for me to continue my basketball career and you know get my master's and, and do all that stuff. Um, but I think I wanted to really focus on, again, the task at hand, which was finishing out my Penn career and having the best season possible. Um, so it was balancing that, but also, you know, wanting to stay on task and, you know, think about what teams and what schools I would really want to go to if I had the opportunity to. Um, so I think things started to really get going once I entered my name into the transfer portal in December, um, just wanting to get my name out there before, you know, the brunt of the league started. Um, just so people were aware I wanted to to make this decision and make this move. Um, and then once our season ended, that's when I was able to take visits and really um, put my 100% focus into choosing where I would go next. 
Um, but I think one of the most gratifying things about this entire process was the fact that I heard from a lot of the schools that I wish I heard of heard from when I was a high school student. Um, and obviously, I've had a, the career to back, you know, the schools I've been able to get offers from this time around. Um, but it was, again, just a really special moment to be hearing from you know, schools I dreamed about going to, USC being one of them. Um, but as much as I love my Penn experience and um, obviously always it was always a plus to want to be home, I wanted to keep an open mind about what my options were and really, again, put academics and basketball and my ability to make an impact in both at the forefront. Um, and I'll just share that it, it came down to a lot of schools in the Pac-12, but eventually I took visits to USC and Michigan. Um, and as great as the school of Michigan is, great, you know, sports culture and great academics, um, a lot of things just really aligned with uh, what I was being offered at USC. Um, and then again, it just so happens it was 25 minutes away from home on a good day. So I think, you know, the stars aligned in that sense that, you know, I did my time at Penn. It was four years of being away from home. Um, and I think, that, you know, there's no better storybook ending to my college career than to, you know, do it at a place that, you know, I could share with, you know, all the people who have supported me and got me to this place. You are a very big music fan. You have a separate Instagram account that is Kayla Padilla Music. Who are some of your favorite musical artists? Sure. So I'd have to say number one is for sure Bruce Springsteen, which is like sort of a curveball to a lot of people when I say who my favorite artist is, just because I don't think you'd expect a 21 Asian American girl who's never been to New Jersey before a few years ago to you know, have such a, a love for Bruce Springsteen. But I think, you know, it just started, I, I have a really, um, I've been subscribed to have an old soul, especially in terms of music. So like growing up, listening to the Beatles or listening to Elvis, um, I think my first favorite artist was Bob Marley. So I think it was just in my blood to kind of, you know, love music from like the 70s. So a lot of my favorite artists now are like Bruce, the Beatles. I love Fleetwood Mac, Elton John. Um, and then again, like you said, I love playing instruments, but also equally just like learning about, um, you know, all that kind of music history stuff. So it's one of my biggest passions in addition to playing basketball. And here's a question that a lot of people can argue about forever if they're Beatles fans is who is your favorite Beatle? Yeah, I feel like my answer could change on any given day. Um, but I honestly want to say it's George. I feel like he obviously he didn't write so like a ton of the Beatles catalogs, but the songs he did write are some of like the best, um, like something um, like Guitar Gently Weeps, like all those songs are just incredible. And um, as I've been able to explore more of his catalog, I just like love, you know, his solo work and, and it aligns with a lot of like my music taste and what I love. So, um, you know, tomorrow I might say Paul, but today I'm going to say George. <laughs> well, that's perfect. Kayla, thank you very much for your time. You have been amazing. Every time I've talked with you, it's been a pleasure. I wish you the best. I will be following your career along just like I have, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate you having me. Thank you, nice talking to you.